Welcome, latecomers. Uh, I'm, again, Matthew Mann. I'm the Director of Academic Programs here at Hillsdale in D.C. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, play a glorified referee and timekeeper. I'll have yellow cards and red cards ready. Um, I'm told Arthur runs a tight ship, so do we. Um, I'm here with the Attorneys Generalissimo, uh, both uh, Theo Wold, who is the Washington Fellow at the Claremont Institute Center for American Way of Life. Theo was an acting Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy at the DOJ and a Deputy Special Assistant to President Trump for Domestic Policy. Uh, and Jeff Clark was the Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division in the Trump Administration. He is now the Director of Litigation for the Center for Renewing America. Uh, we're here to talk about the administrative state and civil service reform. Uh, and I have uh, a number of family members who are in, uh, who have a long history in government and actually in the administration of the executive branch. And they wistfully tell stories of the 1970s and 80s where uh, highway bill engineer or highway department engineers, when they were uh, rebuilding roads, would unbidden by Congress. Uh, actually uh, calculate how much damage their deferred maintenance or their rebuild would do to American taxpayers who are on the road driving uh, and would actually remunerate them, remunerate them with uh, checks on the average of how much cost in tire damage and uh, shocks and suspension. Uh, that seems like a charming uh, <laughs> echo of yesteryear. Turns out they were a bunch of sort of uh, depression era and World War II veteran civil engineers uh, with a conscience and saw themselves as servants of the American people and the taxpayer. Uh, I asked them where that tradition disappeared and they just sort of looked off in the distance and said, the 90s maybe? Gone, right? A whole sort of habit of how to be a bureaucrat um, in a way that reflects the American Republic where the people are sovereign uh, and the government is a servant. Uh, with that, I think uh, we should get to the real meat here. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, Theo Wold, would you like to uh, give us your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I, I come from the Western United States and we love our folk tales out there. So I want to start uh, with folk tale. Um, there was a presidential candidate who you know, had something of an uncertain policy agenda. Um, his supporters said he wanted to reform Washington. His detractors said he really just wanted revenge. Um, and during the course of his campaign for the presidency, um, this candidate charged his opponents with fraud and, and stealing elections. Um, and then on the campaign trail, this candidate for the presidency, he was famous for saying that he was going to initiate these sweeping reforms of Washington. He was going to either throw people in jail or he was going to kick all the bastards out. Um, he was going to go after officials high and low for public corruption and malfeasance and for sort of an arrogant contempt for the rule of law. Now, unfortunately, uh, haste and, you know, you could say probably some naivete about real Washington uh, confused his purpose in the main, and depending on who you ask, left the civil service stronger and more powerful than it was before he even started his campaign. Now, General Jackson was right to confront the civil service. General Jackson was right to say he was going to purge Washington of bureaucrats high and low. And General Jackson was probably right to accuse John Adams, uh, John Quincy Adams, of uh, playing around with, with elections. Um, but I think, as is often the case with conservative attempts at reforming Washington, General Jackson's ideal was right, but the execution was lacking. So General Jackson's idea was essentially an attempt to make implicit, the implicit link between electoral politics and the governance of the regime explicit. 
as the general said at various points, you can't keep a political organization together without patronage. The loyalty of those who fought with you in a campaign, your supporters who bled for you, they surprisingly expect to actually participate in governance if you're successful. And they want to be rewarded for that. So what better way to you know, uh, affirm the support and loyalty of, of your team than make them uh, the postmaster in Lewiston, Maine? In execution, most historians will say that Jackson failed. Uh, for well over a century, we've all been told the progressives folktale about the Jacksonian Revolution, that he didn't really get rid of any of the bureaucracy, but what he did do was he brought in a rabble, um, and that he created the spoils system. And in this telling, the nation is essentially held captive by the crooks and by the cronies until the heroes arrive when the progressives Ransom democracy for the passage of this little statute called the Pendleton Act. And the Pendleton Act and all of its progeny that follow up through Jimmy Carter's 1978 civil service reform had essentially one goal, which was to insulate the civil bureaucracy from political accountability, to protect civil servants. Now, I think in fairness, we would all agree that, that Jackson's idea did fail. He had a, a, you know, a novel concept, what he called a rotation in office, essentially term limits for civil bureaucrats. We, we've never really come back to that concept. We want to term limit the actual democratically accountable leaders of the nation and leave the permanent Mandarin class, which some folks in this room belong to, um, here in Washington as an occupying army. So the idea was good, and you know, Jackson would say, I don't want the civil bureaucracy to remain a, a species of property for these people. But look, even by the numbers, Jackson only took out about 10% of the then existing civil service, which by even the modest standards of 19th century America, 10% was insufficiently small. Now, as I said, the progressives in their uh, folktale, and you can open up any textbook or uh, flip through Wikipedia, and they'll tell you that the Pendleton Act solved all these problems. Um, so gone are the days when bureaucrats govern with partisan prejudice. Gone are, are the days uh, when, when bureaucrats uh, ignore with contempt the requests or orders of partisan political appointees from a different persuasion. And today, thankfully, 90% of the federal civilian workforce, which is now close to about 5 million people, they are protected from their politically accountable bosses. So one of the things I, I want to make clear today uh, is that the Pendleton Act and its progeny, including the 78 Civil Service Reform Act, are in large part responsible for the growth of the administrative state. They move together. Let me tell you one more uh, historical anecdote here to, to frame this. So back in 1838, Congress, uh, reacting to the news cycle, just like it does today, uh, was confronted with a rash of steamboat boiler explosions on some of the most important navigable rivers in America. So the people rightfully demanded action. What are you going to do about all these steamboats blown up? So, Congress, in their wisdom, created a licensing regime at the Department of Treasury. Uh, and it required safety measures, uh, two-year inspections by a select uh, list of appointed engineers that were named by US district court judges. It proved inadequate to the problem, so Congress came back in 1852 and they created the Steamboat Inspection Service, SIS. It was headed by nine presidentially appointed regional inspectors, and they were empowered to propose regulations to the Secretary of Treasury. They had only implementing regulatory authority. The Secretary would propose the actual governing regulations. But that didn't work either. So then in 1871, they said, you know what? We need a central office. We need more than just presidentially appointed personnel. 
Uh, we need uh, regulators, and not just implementing uh, regulatory authority, but we need you to have governing regulatory authority. And then eventually, all of these employees were placed under civil service protection under President Arthur. And the result, wrote a, a recent legal scholar, was to combine something essentially of the New Deal, an independent regulatory commission over steamboats, with great society health and safety regulation by delegating administrative authority to a multi-member board that combined licensing, rulemaking, and adjudicatory functions. Uh, now, I know this anecdote is, is gonna strike some of you uh, to the core because we, we also love to tell a story on our side, which is, well, none of this stuff happened until Wildrow Wilson. I mean, the 19th century was great, uh, and it was truly a conservative republic. Well, uh, it turns out the historical record would indicate otherwise. We've had a problem with federal bureaucrats since the 19th century. I think one of the things I, I want to leave you here with um, is that, uh, look, Cass Sunstein is right. The democratic citizenship in a large, pluralistic, multi-ethnic uh, society like ours is difficult. It's difficult to administer. But what you have to understand is what's on offer from the left today is, as Sunstein says, um, the larger the state necessarily, the larger the bureaucracy to administer it. And the bureaucracy must contain experts. And that's just the trade-off you have to have for the kind of society we want to live in. I would say, instead, um, that the deconstruction of the administrative state begins essentially for us as conservatives uh, intellectually. So tangible deconstruction is really only possible if conservatives begin by deconstructing the mindset of expertise. Rule by experts is foreign to our constitutional separation of powers. It's incompatible with democratic accountability and legitimacy and it's proven itself to be a failure. Now, if you weren't convinced by that four years ago, I think everyone in this room can agree that public health officials, the ultimate experts, are also now the ultimate encapsulation of the failure of professionalized expertise. And so the political branches and the states, they, they must be returned to their lawmaking power. Everyone can kind of agree on that but they also have to relearn to express confidence in that power. So we must accept that things simply will not be done by a smaller administrative state. Some things will have to be thrown aside, and that's the point. Policies that can be achieved only through a vast, expansive administrative tyranny uh, are not worth accepting. And to the extent that they deserve to be pursued, they've got to be housed in branches or levels of government sufficiently responsive to the people and their elected representatives such that that tyranny is then averted. So let me give you just one, one closing, uh, closing couple of thoughts here. Um, <clears throat> look, the unitary executive is a myth. It's a myth. Presidential power largely exists in two forms fixing a signature to documents and rhetoric. The power to reverse prior actions taken by a chief executive also requires affirmative action. That's an important point. Um, as we learned in the Trump White House, you'll, you'll recall this little program called DACA was created uh, on internal sort of essentially DHS letterhead by the Secretary of Homeland Security. Dear Barack, I want to create a new program. Signed, Janet. Well, we thought, look, it's essentially equivalent to a presidential memorandum. There's some underlying rules here, but uh, we can undo a memo with another memo. Um, Article three said, uh, not so fast. To undo a memo from your predecessor, you're gonna to have to do a full rulemaking. And oops. Full rulemaking is going to take more time than you've got on the clock. Better luck next time. So uh, 
an affirmative action is required to undo uh, essentially a negative or unconstitutional action. There are real limits to political rule, which I, I think uh, Mr. Clark and I both experienced in our own ways, both in the White House and at DOJ. I, you know, I'll just share one quick anecdote. When I went over to the Department of Justice, I was told, look, the only way you're really gonna be able to stay in communication with leadership and your component um, attorneys, m my office had 76 attorneys I was responsible for supervising, uh, is, is through your, your, your phone, your cell phone. That's how we all communicate. Oh, okay, great. Where do I get the cell phone? Don't know. But someone's going to come by your office and let you know. Okay, so uh, two days, no cell phone. Eventually, a personnel person came by and said, you missed all these meetings. You have your cell phone. I said, no, I, I, I don't have a cell phone, and no one knows who the guy is who has the cell phone. Oh, it's, it's downstairs. So I, I went downstairs, got the cell phone, the actual hard tech. And then I was told, well, the only way you can log into the cell phone is that your, your secretary, uh, she has that information, all the login passwords and things of that kind. Where is she? Well, uh, because of COVID protocols, she's not coming to the office. Well, how, how, how do I get a hold of her? Well, the directory is available um, on your cell phone. <laughs> so, um, look, the other thing is we, we're often, um, you know, enamored with this idea that we'll create these beachheads, we'll, we'll do all these lists. Everyone in D's got a, DC's got a list, right? Um, I want so-and-so for secretary of this. I want um, so-and-so to be uh, head of personnel office. And one thing I thought was really funny was a, a while ago, you, you probably all recall this, there was a memo that was published. It was leaked to the press and the memo contained this like loyalty oath and uh, you know, they were asking all these appointees would they you know, sign up for the loyalty oath and and the loyalty oath was written by like this 23 year old kid and the press you know, was excoriating this kid and, and saying, you know, gosh, this is so partisan and I mean, this is some kind of Soviet thing and who are these kids? Why are they even in charge of, of presidential personnel? And I'm, I'm actually not talking about Johnny McEntee because this was done in the George W. Bush administration. Same thing, which just shows essentially the paucity of our ideas will actually find people who are ideologically committed and loyal to the chief executive elected by the people by making them sign a, a loyalty oath. That's how we'll do it. Um, it was frustrated under W. Bush, and obviously it, it was frustrated the same under Trump. So uh, no new ideas on our side about ensuring that the political appointees are actually accountable to the chief executive they report to. The other point on political appointees that you've got to keep in mind is that they are essentially um, army rangers operating deep behind enemy lines. And when you're surrounded, it takes a certain type of temperament, a certain type of real courage to essentially tell the people who run your operation, you know what, that's great, I'm going to ignore you. Most people don't have that temperament, and so what they say when they're surrounded by the experts, they say, um, right, so if I ignore you, I won't actually be able to do the job I was hired for, and when the White House calls and X asks for X, Y, and Z, I'm going to say I, I don't have that, because the information's been withheld, the document hasn't been prepared, or I, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Most people in that instance say, you know what? You guys are the experts. You tell me what to do. And the political appointee then is captured by the 60 or 70 attorneys or administrators that supposedly report to them. Um, and that's to say nothing of the political appointees because in a Jacksonian sense, this is still around. The political appointees who uh, come in to, to an agency or department uh, and know nothing about anything. They just happen to be bundlers or, or friends of a campaign manager or associates of the president prior to his election. And the last thing I'll, I'll just say real quick, um, to give you an idea, for those of you who actually advise members of Congress or, or senators, there was um, a recent uh, celebration at the institution, which is still called publicly the University of California at Berkeley. Um, not really much of a university anymore, but uh, professors, uh, Lee Rayford and, and Ula Taylor uh, gave a presentation on Berkeley's purchase of uh, a whole um, 
tranche of documents from J. Edgar Hoover's tenure as director of the FBI. And the, the documents are largely focused on the counterintelligence program that was known as uh, COINTELPRO. And uh, the presentation from the professors and why Berkeley was interested in this tranche of documents was that it, it supposedly was confirmation of the systemic racism of the FBI from its inception through the duration of, of Director Hoover's tenure. Um, for my purposes, I think what's fascinating is they highlighted this line from uh, an internal mo uh, memo that Hoover authored to field agents where he said, the obligation you have is to disrupt, discredit, and destroy the Black Panther movement. The advice I would give any of you who are advising members of Congress when you go to stage what are otherwise meaningless kabuki theater hearings, when you uh, want to exercise oversight by asking the bureaucracy to provide the information that will then allow you to exercise your oversight authorities, unpack that one. The very people you're supposed to be controlling are the ones you're dependent upon for information. When all that's happening, the mantra that you should have in mind is we are failing unless we are disrupting, discrediting, and destroying these people. And until we adopt the Jacksonian approach, and we can, we can speak, I'm sure someone will ask about Schedule F, until we adopt the, the sort of the Jacksonian approach, which is to throw the bastards out, all of them, uh, we will still be living in, in the progressive folktale. Well, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, my second time under a Claremont uh, banner. The last time was out on the West Coast. Uh, and the last time I was in this room was before the Trump administration began, which was in considerably happier days, both uh, personally uh, and for the entire uh, nation. So it's, it's odd to be back here. I think uh, Theo and I did not coordinate, but uh, I think we have a good one-two punch for you. Um, usually I'm, I'm uh, very theoretical, but you, you got uh, Theo on that front. I'm currently under the uh, tutelage of uh, Rachel Semmel in terms of becoming more practical. So I'm going to focus on the practical points today. And indeed, the first place I'm going to start, that's why I called for this microphone, which you'll understand in a second, uh, is uh, not, uh, you know, wasn't in my mind in advance. It's based on a text message I received from one of my lawyers as I was uh, walking here from parking. Uh, and uh, I checked, this is actually uh, a gathering where the Constitution uh, was uh, agreed to. And uh, it's not the Declaration, but let's just imagine for a second it's the Declaration. Here's the anecdote I'm gonna start with that I received from one of my lawyers. He completed a bench trial in one of the January 6 cases yesterday. And he told me that one of the FBI agents testified on the stand that evidence of criminal intent could be proved from a Facebook post that showed uh, the relevant defendant quoting from the Declaration of Independence. Um, <laughs> that should just shock you. And let me just stop there and say, what happens in a properly functioning uh, republic when that happens? And I use the term republic deliberately. Article three should spring into action. The judge should interrupt the judge should say, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want you to understand that the Declaration of Independence is one of this nation's founding documents and that uh, there is a First Amendment right to express ideas based on uh, that document. What should happen with the assistant U.S. attorney, who's the prosecutor, if they didn't deliberately elicit and line up that testimony? They, they should say, uh, you know, yes, yes, Your Honor, uh, the United States Justice Department, uh, the government, the U.S. agrees with that position. But if they elicited it, then what should happen? Now to the Article II branch, back at the Justice Department, back at the FBI, both the FBI agent and the assistant uh, uh, U.S. attorney, they should be called out for that and they should be disciplined. The, the FBI agent who testified to that should be, in my mind, immediately disciplined and in a properly functioning republic, 
uh, you know, should be ejectable from the department. And one of the reasons, well, from the FBI, one of the reasons why that can happen is because of all these civil service protections that are designed to, present, to prevent the executive branch uh, from functioning properly. And what should happen in the Article I branch? There should be oversight of the FBI. What's wrong with your culture if you're having that kind of agent who thinks that it is criminally uh, uh, you know, something that's, that's in the mind of, of one of uh, the constituents of the country that they would dare quote the Declaration of Independence, that they would dare exercise their First Amendment rights? It's truly abominable. And so our topic today is that, uh, you know, uh, about civil service reform. And the FBI obviously are civil servants. And this kind of uh, conduct is getting more and more common as we, you know, are, are in this era where we're living under a government that increasingly I don't recognize. Uh, I idolize the framers in many ways, but I don't imagine that they are... Uh, that they were perfect, that they were really angels, as Madison himself would have, would have recognized. I think that they did not adequately foresee the rise of a professionalized bureaucracy or a protected bureaucracy. And obviously, separation of powers challenges can be brought to that, but in, in the shorter term, uh, you know, pending, pending big litigation about that or a change in, in presidential administration, we obviously need to work on reform at a, uh, at a more uh, retail level, at an easier to uh, achieve level. Um, the control that the executive branch that the president has over the, uh, the career bureaucracy is far too narrow. And there are far too many people, even who get Senate confirmed positions, who do not adequately wield that power. They come just as, as Theo said, uh, to DC, oftentimes not even understanding much about what it is that they do, and they become quickly uh, captured by, uh, by the career bureaucracy. Um, so I want to show you, I want to share some anecdotes with you about how uh, the folks at the Justice Department tried to manipulate the political uh, uh, masters that they have for temporary periods of time. Um, this is an example. I'd seen Sarab in the room. I used uh, on his uh, podcast. I recommend that uh, you you become a regular with his uh, podcast. Uh, but um, I was at the Justice Department after having been sworn in, after having a 14 month delay in my confirmation, for about a week, a week and a half. And I, it was clear that I was, you know, using my LinkedIn account to post certain things. So the career bureaucrats sat me down and they said, we have to talk about your LinkedIn usage. And I said, all right, well, if there's a policy about that, please send it to me. They sent it to me, I read it. Uh, and uh, then they said, you know, we don't want you to use LinkedIn anymore during your tenure in office. And I said, well, I don't see that as being something that the policy says, uh, or even as a necessary implication of the policy. They said, yeah, but it's in the interstices of the policy. So, you know, I pressed further and I said that, uh, well, you know, what interstice exactly is it hiding in? And, uh, you know, they, they eventually admitted, you know, it's just sort of something we would prefer that you don't do. And they said, let us, let us use the, you know, we'll give you an example. We think that it's exactly like nepotism, which you do see as part of our policy, anti-nepotism policies. And I said, how is using LinkedIn nepotism? And the answer was, because it's narrow casting to people who know you. And so it raises concerns that are analogous to nepotism. I, I told them that that was absurd and to get out of my conference room. And I never heard anything uh, back about that after that. All right, so that's one anecdote. Here's, here's another anecdote. Um, I was told that I had to resign my office as the, you know, I had been for a decade the chairman of the Federal Society's Environmental uh, uh, Law and, and uh, Property Rights Practice Group was told I had to resign that. It was an unpaid position, and the Federal Society does not take positions, as most know. Uh, but I was told I had to resign it nonetheless. All right, so, you know, I, I resigned it because, you know, I figured it was time for new blood anyway, and I wanted to focus on my, uh, my actual uh, appointed office. But, you know, fast forward to this administration, we have uh, the assistant, the acting assistant attorney general in the Biden administration of the Civil Rights Division, who is a Stanford law professor, and she is allowed, 
she's allowed to continue collecting her $900,000 salary at Stanford while she continues to serve it, leading the Civil Rights Division. That is unconscionable, and it is clear that a nu neutral bureaucracy is not applying the law fairly to members of you know, different uh, presidential appointees. It's just not how they're proceeding. They're acting in a very result-oriented uh, fashion. Um, in terms of people who don't understand what they're doing, I think obviously that is something that whoever the next Republican president is needs to focus on uh, very carefully. The only way that you can penetrate through these things is to have a deep knowledge of what it is that you're doing or to study up on it if you don't and to have the intellectual candle power to do that and to ask questions constantly. I've found that if I summoned all of the career actors into a room and I started asking them questions about things that they insist cannot change, before the end of that meeting, I've tied them in knots and they've contradicted themselves two or three times. At the end of the meeting, I give them a rundown of the contradictions and then I say, I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. Uh, now that's if, if I give them process. Sometimes if it's so clear that they're playing games, I'll just say, thanks for playing, but it's really time to, you know, for me to actually decide and you know, here we're gonna roll out and here's what we're gonna do. Um, there can't be in the next uh, uh, Republican administration sacred cows. And at the Justice Department, one of the most sacred of the cows is the Solicitor General's office and how it operates. It has, uh, there are only two political appointees at the Solicitor General's office. Only the Solicitor General, uh, him or herself, and the Principal Deputy Solicitor Attorney General. So I wanna contrast that <clears throat> with your story about the Labor Department, where you have a bunch of folks who aren't even reporting to you, but you have 40 of them, right? Um, you know, I remember talking to one of my counterparts in the Bush administration who was at the Labor Department and, and she had intergovernmental uh, affairs. She had 40 people working on uh, for her to engage in that. And I said, look, I'm at the Justice Department. Every day, a billion dollar or a multi-hundred million dollar brief crosses my desk where the bureaucracy, you know, at EPA or some other agency are eating the American people out of house and home with uh, you know, burdensome regulations. And I'm the last line of defense, essentially, in terms of trying to get to a better policy on that. And I don't have anyone that I can call on. Everyone is someone who is in the career bureaucracy. You know, the, the, the political appointees are often uh, misaligned, misallocated in terms of where they're placed. They need to be placed in the priority positions where they can actually help and, and be force multipliers. Uh, so I am gonna come, Theo, to Schedule F. So we need Schedule F, uh, which creates an accepted service. There are officials who, uh, uh, de who, who execute uh, important uh, and significant responsibilities that involve discretion, that involve uh, their exp expertise, and they're ones who should be entirely controllable uh, in a line that traces directly to the president. If you don't have that, you have this you know, system under the Pendleton Act, you have this system uh, under the, uh, uh, the, the Carter system where these people are just insulated. Uh, and so uh, we need to get Schedule F back in place. It was quickly revoked by the Biden administration after President Trump uh, put it out in October of 2020, I believe. Also, there needs to be aggressive use of transfer powers. Most of these bureaucracies are immense. They span multiple states. And if there are people who are uh, in uh, uh, the main hub in headquarters inside DC and they're being intransigent, they need to be uh, trans given the option to transfer to run other things in other parts of the country so that you can get people into uh, their place who will actually uh, work with the administration to achieve its priority priorities. Uh, I also think you need to look at DSESing many of uh, uh, these officials who exercise significant power. Uh, these officials leak, violating their, uh, their confidences. That uh, needs a comprehensive overhaul in terms of what our anti-leak policies are. Um, I'll give you one anecdote there, which goes not back to the Trump administration, but back to my service in the uh, Bush 43 administration. There, I began to look at uh, whether the United States could start taking the position that citizen suits by which uh, private environmental groups, uh, which 
private funding, and we believe oftentimes foreign government funding, are bringing challenges to enforce federal law as if they were the attorney general. Indeed, in the law reviews, they'd taken to calling that whole set of, uh, of statutes that was created in the 1970s as private attorney general's uh, uh, act, acts and actions. Um, you know, to my mind, that is anathema. There is no such thing as a private attorney general. There is an attorney general. Uh, and the attorney general is not even the chief law enforcement officer of the United States. Under the take care clause of Article 2, the chief law enforcement officer of the United States is the president of the United States, full stop. And that's something that I, I think you constantly hear the media contradicting and trying to sell you a bill of goods about. Uh, and it's, it's also something that it seems that, that many of the, uh, you know, the, the intelligentsia think is, is wrong. They want to constantly have an idea of somehow the Justice Department should be hived off and entirely independent of the president. I think that's unconstitutional. Um, and so I'm at the Environment Division, and I've, I'm looking at ending these citizen suits, these private attorney general actions. The day after I had the meeting, a law professor began to write and publicize that, that I was dangerous because I was looking at enforcing the uh, take care clause uh, exclusivity and harnessing that for the executive branch and wanted to cut out the environmental groups. So what was the connection? That law professor's brother worked for me and was in the relevant meeting. So just a complete sieve has to, has to change. Also, one of the key things to do, which is, is that people need to, uh, when they're in these offices, use their power of rating officials correctly. In my mind, if there's an official who is doing everything you ask, that's a B. If there's an official that is obstructing from some, you know, on, along some continuum, they, that's like a C to an F. The ones who get an A are the ones who should be affirmatively and proactively trying to help you achieve the priorities of the president. That's how they should be graded within the civil service. Instead, they're not, uh, they're not graded that way. You're told when you come in um, uh, that if you don't give them all the top grade, they're not accustomed to that, you know, as if they're sunflowers or snowflakes. And uh, that, that has to, uh, to end as well. Um, so let me say one last thing before I turn it over to questions, because I'm sure you're anxious to, to, uh, to have some questions, which is we also need to look at uh, reform of the whole doctrine of qualified immunity. Because even if you can get an energetic sub-executive to get control over the career bureaucracy, even if you could reform the career bureaucracy with Schedule F, you're still going to have situations where agents are doing things or other uh, you know, government officials are doing things that are outrageous and they're protected by you know, either the failure of the Bivens doctrine to extend to it uh, you know, or, or at worst, uh, you know, at, at, as another line of defense, there's a whole qualified immunity issue. The, the idea that, that uh, all of these officials are entirely insulated from any consequences for the most, uh, you know, ex even for the most extreme behavior is something that needs to be re-examined. And with that, I'd like to turn it over for questions. All right, we do have a little time for questions. Yeah, please. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, well, first of all, I don't think there's anything that Schedule F does that Schedule C can't already do. So whether or not we get Schedule, schedule F, but can you talk a little bit about um, career bureaucracy, national security agencies, and the difficulty with clearance, suitability and fitness, entrance to agencies? Yeah, uh, just real quick, I'll jump in on there. So, so I think um, one of the, the interesting things here and twofold is um, the, the civil bureaucracy that is, I mean, look, just by temperament, disposition and tenure, usually opposed to a Republican president, even the most milquetoast of Republican presidents, also controls uh, the, the clearance vetting process, determining who will um, first be eligible to take positions in the government, but also then who will be eligible to receive clearance uh, to handle the most sensitive information. And I think it's deeply naive, deeply naive at this point uh, to, to presume as we continue to do so that that process is not partisan or politicized. Um, and and I, I like to link, and I, I said, so the second part here, as I said, two parts, 
I like to link this same discussion, though, to a point that Senator Moynihan made in his book years ago on, on government secrecy, which is at the same time that the bureaucracy makes uh, these impossible hurdles for certain political appointees to receive clearance authorization, they have proliferated the ability of subcontractors, some three million subcontractors, to have access to classified information. And Moynihan's point back then was, Who's determining what is classified information? That just that the, the marking of certain documents or certain information as classified is so beyond the scope of the White House and the president who has that ultimate authority um, that, it, that it's certain, something of a, of a shell game now. And I think all of this is sort of operating in the background of the raid at Mar-a-Lago, which is anyone who's gone through the vetting process, anyone who has dealt with, with classified or secure information knows um, that it, it's something of, of a joke. It's something of a joke. There's too many people with access who shouldn't have access, and then the actual political appointees or appendages and advisors of the president who are denied having access then leave the chief executive reliant, of course, on the civil bureaucracy to provide expertise, briefing, and information. That has to be totally revisited, and a serious Congress would look at Mar-a-Lago would look at the NSC leaks from the Vinman twins, the permanent NSC establishment from the intelligence agencies, and make this a top level priority. This, this would be number one out of the gate in January. So, uh, you know, I, we're working on a project at the Center for Renewing America about uh, these issues, Andrew, so uh, watch for that. Um, we, we have ideas about how to try to put in place uh, some fixes, but the, the the personal anecdote I'll tie to that then basically is that I would encapsulate the, the classification regime as being one where it, the career people use that, the ones who have clearance, in order to manage their bosses. Basically, they come to you and they say, we have a decision point you need to make, and that requires access to certain information, and so we're gonna process adding to your packages these you know, uh, additional security tickets. Um, and then, you're let in on the mystical regime, the doors open up, you get the briefing, right? And then it's always clear where they want you to go. But the thing is, you don't know what you don't know because they, but they often know what you don't know, which is why they're trying to manage you by showing you a narrow window. It's almost like security peep show, right? They open the little window and you can, you can look through what they've chosen to let you look at. And that needs, that needs to uh, uh, be changed. And, and in terms of uh, Mar-a-Lago, there are just so many games that, that can be played, and the current game that seems to be uh, you know, underway against President Trump is that the, there are documents that were marked classified, which made you know, the subpoena, et cetera, a kind of uh, trap for the unwary. Um, you know, they don't even know, it seems, based on the disputes as I've seen them unfolding in court as to what, whether it actually was uh, unclassified or not. In other words, like, all they know is it's marked classified, but they don't know whether it's still classified. So there's this kind of, you know, uh, uh, is it Alphonse and, and Gaston, like fight about like who goes first? Like, we want you to tell us whether you think it's classified. And, you know, the Trump lawyers are saying the reverse to the Justice Department. It's bizarre, right? Shouldn't there be a master list of what is classified or not? Why is there, you know, and, and then, the, then you had the special master saying, I might not even have to look at the documents because if the government told me they're cl marked classified, that's all I need to know, which, you know, how can you exercise any Article 3 or Article 3 derivative function as a special master if you can't even look at the documents? And, and it's worse than that. It's a deliberate blinders. Like, I might, I, I want to look for ways not to look at the documents. The system is completely screwed up, Andrew, and, and it needs to be reformed top to bottom. Yeah. Well, that's, but that's, that's part of trying to tie the, the hands of the president as well, because then the, if you watch the talking heads on MSNBC, what they say is, oh, oh you know, the president can't just pronounce en masse some group of documents unclassified. He has to go through a process, process. and then everyone has to stamp it, you know, like at the conclusion of the process. It's, you know, it's similar to Theo's point about we won't let you change policies, and this is what the Solicitor General's office often does when a Republican administration takes over is you can't change the policy until there's a new rulemaking. So you can't change it until you followed our process. Where is that process in the Constitution? Nowhere. The president's in charge of classification and declassification. Yeah, exactly on that point, uh, 
Well, before you begin, one second. We're supposed to break now, but uh, since we started five minutes late, we're going to take a couple more questions, but very brief. So just quickly, the executive, uh, the entire federal classification system is built on an executive order, as you know. It comes out of the presidency. Why did the Trump administration do nothing with that in the entire four years? And in addition, why did the president, when he thought that he did declassified Russia, Russia Gate documents, he could have simply called in the lawyers, issued an executive order, named the documents. I mean, it seems to me, looking from uh, has this, how this played out, with, he got lousy legal advice. He could do an executive order, and it could have been done, and the White House let down the administration by not tackling that subject. You want to take that, Theo? Uh, uh, sure. So, I mean, look, the one thing I'll say is, uh, uh, so this isn't profound, but when you elect an outsider, um, there are going to be some things that are missed, right? Um, because there's just a general paucity of, of, of information about the inner workings of the bowels of government. Um, and also, the one other thing that's tied to this is uh, there's a, a, a permanent and sort of intelligence apparatus uh, that exists, the NSC, you know, is not staffed by hires that the chief executive makes himself. The security intelligence agency says these are the people that we're giving you on, on detail. So from the, the, the moment the clock starts to run, and this is a point I wanted to make earlier, which is that the bureaucracy always knows how much time is on the shot clock, always. Uh, from the moment the clock starts to run on the four years, uh, any, any chief executive on our side, any president is going to have to make the determination, do I brook a fight with the security agencies now, or do I trust that we're not going to have any issues, there's not going to be a dirty bomb in Manhattan or anything, and I, I can trust them to provide me good information, good intelligence, and that the folks that they're sending over on details will more or less be in line with my foreign policy and security agenda. I think the Trump administration started in one posture and then, it, and then quickly pivoted, and, and then we got uh, the leaks. Uh, we got the first Ukraine call. I mean, look, a, a funny anecdote I'll tell is I, I ended up translating for the president um, multiple um, communications he had in Spanish because it was so bad that the president didn't even trust the official translators uh, because those individuals were, were known by, by year three to be leaking the, the private conversations he was having with foreign leaders. Um, and, and my Spanish is okay, uh, but that's, that's, that's how bad it was. So, I mean, I think in hindsight, it's easy to second guess an arm court, you know, armchair quarterback, like, oh, you should have led with an EO on this. But, but the, the game theory was lead with an EO on, on the deep state intelligence bureaucracy and you will open up uh, a multi-front war. And let's avoid that. And we ended up there anyway, but uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's slightly unfair to say you should have led with the EO to revisit that from, from the beginning. What we know now, I mean, I think anyone who's a part of these transition projects, I mean, like, put that in the book. There should be an executive order that leads with this in the next Republican presidential administration. That, on that question, I wasn't involved in that. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to second guess it. I think it's, you know, be easy for me to armchair quarterback it as well and say, look, that turned out to be a big problem and then work backwards to, you know, here, here are the solutions. I wasn't, uh, you know, involved in that discussion. So I'll, you know, I'll just uh, say that um, I, I agree with Theo that we now see it to be such a huge problem that it needs to be a going in problem and that the, the game theory this time shouldn't be to leave it till later. The game theory should be, it's so important it has to be attacked from, from uh, as soon as possible. I think we're out of time. So with that, thank you very much, both of you. Thanks.